back in my creative world of stenciling. Web workshop number six, we've already had a look at number five, where we showed you how to uh, cut a stencil <coughs> from a ready-made stencil design. But this time we're going to take that a little further and uh, show you how to make a stencil from your own design. I'm also going to talk to you about the different types of paints and show you, oh, a whole lot of tricks using stencils again. So, necessity is the mother of invention, they say. How well that has applied to my life in my creative life over the years because yes yeah, stencils make me look good stencils are so much fun to use and I use them for all sorts of purposes my snake skin is something we're going to explore today and before I forget I'll point you to the fact that on my website in the web workshops pages you will find uh, all the resources for this, including the stencil design for this snakeskin and a how-to on, on doing it. So yes, there are all sorts of support notes for you there. Anyway, just a little background story. I love to colour bags. And one of the favourite designs for my quilting ladies and textiles teachers is this one because it sort of indicates sewing using scissors and pinwheels and buttons and all sorts of things. Well, doing the heliography technique late one afternoon, I thought, I want maximum sun on this bag. Not this one, it was another one. And so I had everything out in my garden, in the sun, but I'd lent it up at an angle to catch the best sun. So, had my scissors sitting up against my design and all of a sudden, because of the weight of the handles, they did a lovely little slide down <laughs> across the bag and I ended up with this really incredible mess. So, necessity being the mother of invention, I decided, well, let's make a stencil of those scissors and I want to talk to you now just about a basic principle for getting your stencils done. I think it was that P, yes. Okay, when you look at a shape, any shape, it could be a rose, it could be a bunch of flowers, it could be a whatever you want to make a stencil of, there will be a shape and some pieces will be up and some pieces will be down on that shape. So I can see that that part of the scissors sits across the lower blade. Stenciling is all about, well to get a stencil that holds together well, is all about making bridges there that will hold that stencil together. So the bridge will go on the back part of the shape, not the front part of the shape. So you can see I've got my bridges leaving the front bit straight. Um, then it's a case of, okay, how can I do those handles so the middles don't fall out? And again, a couple of bridges to hold it there just to stabilise it, a couple more bridges, and the stencil shape was done. And folks, this has been one of my most popular stencils. And um, yes, you can see it on the bag, hanging on the wall used for heliography all the time instead of using the, sh the scissors themselves. Of course, just a reminder, we covered a little bit about heliography uh, in past web workshops. Your objects need to sit flat against your surface to get your best representation. Pop things out in the sun, what's around those objects will go darker, while what's under those objects will go lighter. So heliography is just one of the many, many fun things that I do. So that's making a stencil from a shape that exists. Let's now look at maybe a line design that you have in a book. And I'm just going to take a simple pansy shape here and turn it into a stencil. I'll just use the one I've already done as a reference. Okay, when I look at my pansy design, I can see that some petals, this one here, is sitting above that little fella tucked in at the back. That one there 
is sitting above also the little one tucked in the back and then we come down to the the front of the the um the the face of the pansy if you can see a complete curve of a shape as you can all the way around there that's likely to be the front bit okay so that's what i'm going to use as my guide and i'll just take one of these fellas up here on the side and bring you in a little closer Okay, so I'm going to draw those complete curves. I could do it in, in a felt pen if I wanted to, but if you're a bit nervous about it, just do it in pencil first. So my complete curve there on both of those petals will then have the bridge tucked in behind it. So my back petal, or my back shape in this case, whether it be scissors or... <laughs> whatever you're doing a stencil of, has the bridge then behind it, coming round on this little petal with the flip on it. Again the same thing, and I'll ignore the flip on this case, but you could do it. The little, I call them the eyes or the nostrils of the pansy, the two little circular bits there. And once you've established the shape, your next handy gadget is the fat black felt pen. Just get a bit of scrap paper. Where you can confirm that you've got it right. So you could scribble that in in pencil first if you wanted to. And all of a sudden you'll see your, your, your shape coming to life, no matter what that shape is that you're doing. Look, some things are a bit tricky to do. If you're ever working a shape and you really want to get it right and you have a <laughs> can't figure, can't quite figure out how, all you need to do is send me a design and we can work on it together. And we don't want to spend the rest of this workshop just watching me colour in. A very handy thing to have when you're doing all this is just some liquid paper. So that if you do put a line where you don't want it, you can just white it out. And it means you're getting your design right before you actually put it onto the stencil sheeting and then burn it as the stencil. Very early in my writing for um, embellished days, I'll leave that at that, you should have the idea from that. Yep, very early on in my writing for embellished days, I did an article called Capturing Memories. My memory was my Nan's favourite rose, Queen Elizabeth Rose. My starting point was a coloured image of that rose. First thing you need to do, so that you can actually see the shape better, is to photocopy it in black and white. Then, using your fat black juicy felt pen, go over those lines, which allow you to see that image a whole lot more clearly as a line design. From there, you can choose exactly as I did on that simple five petal shape of the pansy, all the separate shapes of the rose. And I have done on that exactly as you saw me do on that first little sample. And there we have the memory complete. So from photograph, to the final design, simply then cut out with the stencil burner. Yep, there isn't, haven't been too many shapes over the years that I haven't been able to conquer. 
And later on in this workshop, I'm going to talk to you about a three-part stencil, which will allow you then to easily cut something like the tulips that you see here in front of me. Before we go on with talking about the different types of paints that I have, I want to talk to you about the book that I was working from with the pansies and that I used for the hibiscus design in the, the first stenciling session. Um, this is a book that I produced for our 20th anniversary. It's called 20 Designs for Our 20th Anniversary. And in there is a, it's a compilation of favourites from over the years. There's all sorts of things in here. It was a, a book I was giving away during our celebration year and I would love you to have a copy too. Simply go into the web workshop page of the Ed Centre on my website and you can download a copy of that for yourself. Or if you'd like a printed copy, please let me know uh, when you send your orders in and I can pop that in with your goodies. Okay, one of the favourite designs in this book is of course my abstraction design. And you'll see me use this in so many different places. If you've got a crazy mind like mine, I think you'll love it too. Now for the paints to use. We don't have a lot of different paints in our range. These paints have been formulated by me with our paint manufacturers and actually are made here in my studio. Handmade paints, they're a niche product, a very beautiful soft base cold cure product, the only soft base cold cure paints at this stage made in Australia. We are so proud of these. Yes, they don't leave any feel in the fabric. You can scrunch up your fabrics and they will just feel soft. Different types of paints for different purposes. We have 20 in our flats for light fabric range. We have four metallics, silver, gold, copper and pearl. We have four electrics, yellow, pink, orange and green. I call them electric because when I first saw these as uh, produced by a paint chemist, I thought, oh wow, these are just electric. And I love the, the vibrance of them. Some people call them neon, some people call them fluorescence or fluoros. Yes, these are fluoro under a UV light. So. The electrics and the flats for light fabric are designed for use on light coloured fabric and you saw me use those in the first session of our stenciling. Um, flats for dark fabrics then became an essential. What can we use on our darker fabrics, our medium to dark fabrics and it's fl the flats for dark and metallics that I've worn, uh, um, I've painted onto my snakeskin design so that they show on dark fabrics. Because of the higher pigmentation content of these uh, paints, the flats for dark, do leave a slight feel in the fabric but nothing firmer than any other commercial product out there or any other design printed onto dark fabric. These are all totally washable, totally ironable. Yes, you can put a hot iron straight on them and nothing is going to come off onto your iron, which is a huge plus when you want your dark fabrics to look good. What else do we need to know about these paints? They are cold cure. These don't need any heat setting whatsoever to keep them in the fabric. Cold cure means, yeah, just that. You leave them alone. You paint them, leave them for three days to cure before you throw them in the wash. But they are very fast drying, so you can paint them and use them straight away. Well, probably within half an hour to an hour, depending on the technique you've used. Uh, in some techniques, they are almost instantly dry. They will bond to your fabric any fabric or fibre whatsoever and are just the most versatile paints for all sorts of repairs around the house at home. So if you've got chips on the fridge, chips on your car, little bits out of the, the furniture or, or the skirting boards, you can use these paints to fix it. Anyway, 
they're good fun to work with. Last um, session, you saw me working with flat paints in stenciling and printing techniques. Here we've got exactly the same thing. Pop a bit of cardboard up your uh, leg of the sock and you can, you can print stenciling, whatever, onto your dark fabrics. Again, totally washable, totally ironable. Loads of fun. They are very fast drying, as I've mentioned. And I'm just going to bring you in a little closer again while I show you some extra bits and pieces here. Sometimes when we're working with these paints, they're drying too fast and you need longer to work. So we have an additive called retardant. Ah, get this right one of these days. This slows down the drying time of the paint to give you longer to work. So if I'm working on something like the gum trees you can see here in front of me, by having some retardant in my paint, I have longer to play with that paint. It keeps it open longer. Sometimes the paints are a little thick to flow from the brush easily. So we have a paint thinners. And so we add the thinners to the paint and it also again helps you with the length of time you have and the length of stroke you can do because you get more flow from your brush. Both of these products come with a flat cap, they're liquid products and like all our liquid radiance they come with a flat cap, take off the flat cap, put on a dispenser cap and the instructions are on the bottle but you only need a couple of drops of those into the paint in your palette and that just adjusts the, the drying time and the spreadability time. Our third additive is called paint reducer. It's the clear paint base and it is just brilliant for making translucent colours. If you wanted to do, for example, a lead light window onto a white fabric, you start with your reducer in your palette or mixing vessel, add your colour to it a little bit at a time until you achieve the colour result that you want and then apply that. So yeah, see-through paint, amazing. And we do do the three of them as an additive with the necessary caps so that you can um, get them at a bit of a reduced price and, a, and notes to go with them. So the three additives. You'll notice that the flat paints in our range all have a purple letter on their label, as do the additives. Anything with a purple letter on its label can be mixed with anything else with a purple letter on its label to create whatever colour or painted effect you need. You may or may not have noticed at this stage that the liquid radiance paints that I've been working with in our previous sessions um, all have a blue letter on their label and we'll be working with the liquid lusters in today's session as well. Anything with a blue letter on its label can be mixed with anything else with a blue letter on its label. Again, to create whatever painted effects you want. But don't mix blues with purples because they are built on different paint bases and you won't get the maximum washability and ironability from the uh, end result. Now, for the fun bit, identifying these paints. As with liquid radiance, you know we don't put names on the labels because everybody can tell yellow from red from blue and so on, but we do have dots on some of the lids so that, yeah, it makes it easier to sort out the ones that are a bit tricky. We do not name the colors on the labels of our flat paints. Also remembering that this is saving $2 a bottle in production costs. Yeah, and again, people can tell yellow from red from blue. We do have a couple of little tricks for you though. Some will have a spot on them. 
And there's a sheet on the website that explains why they're sh sh uh, the spots and how these will help you to identify them. For example, with the two blues there, the blue and the ultramarine are so alike in the bottle, but the blue has a spot on it. Okay, more about that. Hunt it down, find the sheet on the page on the website. When we then get to our flats for light and our flats for dark white, the whites look pretty much the same. Well, they are. So I've adapted the scheme that you see on my colour chart here. Anything that can be used on light fabric is on a light background. Anything that you see on a dark background can be used on a dark fabric. The metallics, good news, can be used on light or dark fabrics. So on the labelling, flats for dark have dark printing, sorry, dark background with light printing. Flats for light have light background with black printing. And that's your way of identifying them. Please then use the principle that I've mentioned with your liquid radiance. Write the name on them yourselves and that's your saving in production costs. Easy. Simple system, you've just got to know it. What I'm going to do now is pretty much do the technique that I used on my snakeskin design and you will find these notes on the website, reminder. Notes, design and of course you get to make your own stencil. This is one of those stencils that <laughs> A little bit weird to to cut onto a, a an A4 sheet because there's so little room around the edges but at least on the notes I show you how to use masking tape around there I just find the A4 stencils a whole lot easier to store maybe that's me being lazy what I do like to have when I am working with stencils though is a good couple of fingers distance around the edge of my stencil so that I don't have to worry about slopping paint over the edge as I work. So I'm just going to use some flat for light yellow and some flat for dark yellow on this floral design. I'm also going to use white for dark. There are a couple of things I want to explain to you as we go. We take off the cap, flop the paint down. Remember that if the paint's not coming out you don't keep squeezing because you're likely to blow the whole cap. Okay, that seems a lot of paint, but it's not. I'm now just going to use a bit of craft paper to wipe that cap. Pop the cap back on as far as it'll go. So inside of the cap is sitting against the end of the nozzle and stopping the air getting at the paint. Flats for light, that's the flats for dark, and they'll look the same in the palette, but very different on the fabric. Again, wipe the nozzle, pop the cap on, they are fast drying, flop them down. Pin's handy just in case I need it for clearing the nozzle. You've seen me do that before. And this is a really quick painting job, folks, so I'm not going to use the um, medium or retardant, the thinners or retardant in this. I can certainly get by without it. But if I was doing a long project, I would be adding those things. Our rollers, my own design. Load each roller. Dab, dab, dab across the paint and then stretch it in the tray of the palette. Dab, 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 and stretch so that it's nice and evenly loaded. You've seen me do this before in the earlier programs. And once that's evenly loaded, here we go. I'll start with the white in the middle. Load more paint as you go. I'm not pressing down with the roller. Just aiming for a nice even coverage.
Remember that the stencil is stuck to the fabric using an adhesive spray, but not stuck permanently. It's a repositionable adhesive. So spray the back of your stencil. Let it sit for a couple of minutes before you actually put it onto the fabric. That way you can lift it off really easily without <laughs> a permanent stick. The fabric is also held firmly on a surface. Now I'm just using a piece of sprayed stencil sheet so that nothing is moving as I'm working. It just holds everything securely. But if you're just working on an old sheet, that's fine too. Here goes the flat for light onto the pink fabric, hot pink fabric. I can expect some color change and yes, I'm seeing that go orangey. If you wanted to paint yellow onto blue fabric, for example, it'll end up greeny. So when you're working flats for dark, sorry, flats for light on your medium colored fabric, expect that color change to happen. They will work. However, just put a little bit more of that out onto the palette. making a bit of splurty noises there because the paint wasn't down behind the nozzle. That's all right, you just give it a bit of a bang, it'll be happy. What you can do with your flats for light fabrics is use them over a dark base, a flats for dark white base. And then they will come up true to color. And as I take the stencil off this piece shortly, you'll see exactly that happening. Here we go now though, with the flats for dark yellow. You move up there a bit you, hey? There we go. And so the yellowness is there immediately. So yep, your flats for dark are gonna show up true to color on your dark fabric. Sometimes they need a second coat depending on the absorbency of your fabric. But I'm not pushing down firmly. If you push too firmly, it's going to go under the edge of your stencil. I'm simply going to blend those colors across. Then we will remove the stencil and you can see the end result. And this is exactly the way my snake skin was done, just using copper on either end, copper metallic, white in the middle, and then dry rolling a little bit of olive across the top of it. It's all in the notes there for you to follow. So blend that across. And this is what I call dry roller, just a light touch. The paint is not dry because dry paint won't bond. Let's blend a little bit of that across dry roller, get that nice blend happening. And that's done. Off she goes. So you can see how significantly stronger the flats for light, dark is over the flats for light on that finished piece. Cleaning your stencils. I've got an old cutting board out on my studio sink. Just Rest it on the cutting board, use the old toothbrush to scrub away, soap and water, and when you've done the one side, flip it over and do the reverse as well, just in case any colour has been pick it, picked up underneath the stencil, and uh, pat it dry between two layers of towel. Your rollers, look, the sooner you can wash them out, the better. We know that they can be turned into watercolour. Handy hint though, is that the flats for dark don't do quite as well as watercolours. You've seen the watercolour that I created in the first session. So I'm just gonna drop these <laughs> in a little container of water now and do them later. Before we go on to the three-part stencil, I want to show you a really clever piece of 
hand design fabric. It wasn't done by me. A friend brought it in to show me what she was doing um, as a memory quilt for her mum's 60th birthday. And I looked at that fabric and I thought, wow, no, that's not purchased fabric, but it's way too good to be done by hand. No, it was done by hand. These pieces of fabric, and I was lucky enough to get off with a few samples. These pieces of fabric were done by first up colouring the white fabric with liquid radiance, just all over. Relatively even colour, didn't have to be completely even. The next step was to apply the stencil, the darker blue flowers here, or a little, um, little stencil from a $2 shop. So you don't always have to cut your own. And then, because that paint was darker than the base fabric, flats for light were used. On top of that though, flats for dark white was used to give that third layer of dimension. Really exciting fabric. Same thing with burgundy and flesh. Ah, sorry, salmon pink. Ah, there's no flesh. Right, flesh is in the flats for light. Get it right, Anne. And again, you see the same thing. The purple piece, however, was done using stamps. Not these that I'm showing you, but just stamping is a wonderful, simple way of getting your design onto your fabrics. And it's much easier to load your stamp using a roller rather than a brush because with a brush there's the danger of catching too much paint in the dinty bits of your stamp and then getting it go blob uh, onto your fabric so yep loading with a roller is great using the retardant on something when you're stamping is also going to keep that paint wetter while you're working ready to stamp it so yes you've got the yummy stamped design in two layers on the purple piece. Think about retardant. Definitely useful when you're doing things like tartan fabric. And this was in the Scotland version of Embellish a couple of years ago. If you need more information about that, please let me know. Just using masking tape, really easy to build up a design, um, using rollers and then the retardant of course keeps that paint open longer. Flats for dark used on this of course, but flats for light black used on this purple satin and I did 30, uh, let's get the amount right, and I did eight metres of that for a young lass uh, for her graduation frock. Hmm, that was fun. Definitely needed the retardant in that. Thinking stencils and masking tape, as we've just done, look what you can do with stencil shapes and masking tape to create what we call a silhouette window. Again, the paint can be either rolled or brushed onto that, and that was done using the metallic flats in silver, gold and copper. When you're working on a garment, of course, you need to pop something inside the garment to stop the paint going from front to back, as I did with my snake skin. When you're working on a simple design with just the one stencil and moving your stenciling around, stencil around with a lot of different colours, that's when it's really handy just to have some paper to mask out any areas where you don't want your design to stray. Because the paints are so fast drying, you can move that stencil around quite quickly and sometimes you cover back underneath the stencil as well as on top, but you'll soon figure that one out. However, I think it's time to talk about that three-part stencil that I mentioned a little while ago. This one was of course done on light coloured fabric, 
so I'm using flats for light and again I had taken my photo and turned it into a grayscale, copied it, traced it over onto the back and from there made my three-part stencil. Having decided which colour I wanted to use where, it was then a case of just marking up the stencil so that the um, pieces that were going to be the holes ended up as complete lines and the other lines became the dotted lines so that when I was painting it I wasn't straying into the bits that were close by. I did figure out that it was okay to do the orange and the red purples, uh, <laughs> purples, orange and the red tulips on the same piece but just a little bit of a cover there and there did the job. So once they were done it was then a case of pop on my second part of the stencil I didn't really have to wait long because these paints are touch dry in no time flat. Do those. Third part of the stencil was then the leaves. On went the green. Stencil done. From memory to end result. So simply <laughs> with the aid of a stencil. Gosh, I have fun with stencils. I hope you will too. For the final part of our stenciling journey in this workshop, we're going to delve into the world of liquid lusters. Mmm, love these paints. Liquid luxury, I call them. They came about after a discussion um, at one of our meetings where we girls get together. And somebody in the group had said to me, Anne, do you think we could ever get this, this that we were referring to as liquid radiance, do, we have, do you think we could ever get this in gold? And I'm thinking, well, that is a question I haven't asked our manufacturers yet, remembering that liquid radiance is my own product and my own exclusively ours thing. Hmm, maybe, maybe we could have it in gold. Maybe we could have it in silver and copper and pearl as well. So in asking the question, I just love the answer. And the answer was, uh, yes, we can do it, but it's not gonna look any good in the bottle. Now, one of the things I love about our manufacturers is they are so particular about producing just the best product. If it doesn't look any good in the bottle and it goes into shops, well, it may not sell because people are gonna say, oh, that's off. Well, liquid radiance, liquid lusters are different. And I said to the chemist at the time, I said, hey, don't forget, we're going to teach our people to use that. All we've got to do is tell them to shake the bottle and write that on the label. So, yep, when you see a bottle of liquid luster looking a little bit separated and a little bit, eh, how's your mum? All you've got to do is shake the bottle. And like all our liquid products, you're going to take off the flat cap, put on a dispenser cap. And folks, if you were in the room with me here now, I would be passing these around and you'd all have some to shake. Give them a jolly good shake. Make sure the caps are closed, especially if you're working over your work like I am. But you wouldn't do that, would you? No, of course you wouldn't because I'm going to tell you not to. OK, we're giving these a jolly good shake. If they have been sitting for any length of time without being used, it's a really good idea to take off the cap, use a sauté stick and give it a good old stir to pick up any flake that's on the bottom of the bottle because the last thing you want to happen is to have finished all the liquid and find there's a lovely big thick lot of flake sitting on the bottom that you haven't used. So a good way to tell if the flake is all up is to turn your bottle over, and it'll take a little time, but you'll start to see the bottom run clear. That's just starting. So I know the flake is up where I want it in the liquid. Now these are quite thick paints, but they are liquid. I'm just going to put a little bit of gold 
And don't do, do this over your work. And some silver and some copper. Note that I haven't closed these lids straight away. That gives time for the product to go back out of the cap into the bottle and not splurt out down the sides and waste it. Me and my Scottish blood, I won't waste anything. So we've got silver, gold and copper on the palette. I'm just going to do some leaves. A little um, Japanese maple leaf here cut as a stencil. Let's pop that on again, sprayed with adhesive spray, stencil stuck to fabric, fabric stuck to the surface underneath your surface could be as I have a sprayed stencil sheet or a sprayed board or just an old sheet. We're going to choose a brush appropriate for the design area into, work, into which we're working. If you're doing a big area, choose a big brush. If it's a tiny area, a tiny brush. But I'm just going to take this medium brush and as always in my little thing of water down beside me, I'm just going to wet that brush and dry it thoroughly. You should remember that from our silk painting. It just prepares the bristles for dropping the colour. These brushes are the ones I call the elites in our range. They've got a beautiful firm bristle for working the paint into your fabric easily and evenly. Especially chosen by me because they're right for the job. On feathers you can come out so we can see you. Yep. So here we go, dipping into the paint and working down well off the edge of your stencil into the design area. Make sure your brush is moving before you hit the edge of the stencil. I'm just going to do this quite randomly. That's my style. You can be more organised and precise with it if you want. It would be your style. Also part of my style is I like to fade that paint out as I move into the centre of the area. Thinking thirds, one third vacant, two thirds paint gives you a nice balance to your work. And I'm painting with the shape of the leaf that, and my way of thinking of that is every stroke is going towards where the stem hits the top of the leaf. Coming in for a bit of gold now. Do we need to wash the brush? No. Only if you want to. It's another job. We're blending the colours anyway. I'm making sure my paint isn't sloppy in my fabric. Yeah, excess can be the enemy with the lustres as well. And there's a thing with the lustres that I call bleed out. When you're working with these, the flake component is going to stay where you put it. But if you put too much on, the liquid contain, co component can bleed away and bleed under your stencil. The good news is, in doing something like this, the bleed out won't be seen because I'm working on black fabric. Neat trick. But if you are working on light, light coloured fabric, you will see that bleed out and it can be quite ugly. So just be really, really careful that you're not applying too much. With a little bit of practice, you'll be fine. Just putting these on quite randomly. That's my style. You know that by now. Now if I were finished, off would come the stencil and that would be it. But I'm now going to add some colour to that. I've just got a messy bit there that I'll fix up. You fixed? Yeah, that'll do. I will wash. That excess flake out of the brush. Liquid lusters are not suitable for diluting with water. 
because we don't know at what point you wash the flake away from the binders that hold that flake into the fabric. So make sure you don't dilute them with water. I'm going to add liquid radiance colour to it and I'm going to use the concentrates for the same reason, not the diluted ones. Oh, of course, if you're doing paper crafts and you want to add the luxurious touches to your paper craft, yeah, then it's okay to <laughs> um, dilute your, your lustres. I'm just going to have a couple of drops of each colour here to add to my design. Yeah, I, going back to the papers, you're not really going to wash them too often, are you? So here's just a couple of drops of Liquid Radiance Concentrate. And I'm going to use those randomly over the base colours I've put down there. Look, the colour representation you can get here is absolutely limitless. You will actually find this um, done in the current issue of Embellish magazine, current being it is now um, June. 2021. So I'm randomly stroking that concentrate over the base in the same way as I did the, um, the metallics. I didn't use the pearl in this piece today. The pearl is a translucent flake, so you don't get the intensity of the colour. But by golly, it's a beautiful colour when you just want lovely highlights. This is starting to look a mess, and you get used to that. The mess that you're seeing is on the stencil and it tends to detract from what's going on in the middle of your design. So I've just put a little bit of green, a bit of blue, and now a bit of magenta into there. Again, any old way. No specific placement. You can be precise if you want to. It's your work of art. In my embellished project, I've done maple leaves, Canadian maple leaves, real ones from Canada. As a stencil, of course. Okay, now I haven't even been careful as to where I've put those colours. Sure, I put them on randomly. But if I went into the, the dark patch in the middle of that light leaf, it's not going to show. So if I just put some colour onto the black now, make sure you can see it, because you can't. The beauty of wearing black when you're <laughs> working with liquid radiance is if you get any on you, it's not going to show up. But um, yeah, so when you're working on something like that, any liquid radiance that may bleed out uh, will not be seen in the black fabric. Now let's see what we've actually achieved here. And there we have our beautiful end result. Ta-da! Finished. The cleanup is the same. Wash the stencil carefully. Wash your brushes backwards and forwards in the palm of your hand. Grip and waggle. Get those brushes nice and clean. Now I've just got grotty fingers. And um, yeah, give the brushes a good old rinse before you put them away. In summary, there are two lots of metallic paints. There are the flat paints, the thick creamy ones, and there are the liquid lusters in exactly the same colours. Do they do exactly the same thing in your fabric? Not quite. The lusters, by virtue of their name, have that extra sheen to them that a thick creamy paint cannot ever achieve but it just depends on what you're going to be doing with them as to which ones you use and of course your own preference could you do the silhouette window with the lusters yes could you do the uh, maple the Japanese maple leaves with the flat paints yes 
depends on what you want to do and what you have. So enjoy all that and we'll take those techniques further in different sessions. Thank you once again for joining me.